Welcome, everyone. Good morning. Um, this is the next session in our MC Squared Live Remote training. Um, today will be basic test scan, SEM operation, and maintenance. Um, so this will suffice for the initial training if you're an MC Squared user. And if you're not, um, just please take this as uh, instruction and basic operation in SEM. Um, I'm going to go over today a little bit of SEM operation, EDS spectrum collection, and um, we'll use a standard sample of ours, so I'll show some best practices and stepwise how to set up the microscope. Um, so we've not yet um, vented the chamber to load our sample. Uh, what we're going to do today is just run one of our standard samples here. Uh, so I'm going to go ahead and get started. So first step is to vent and load the sample. Um, so I'm going to go over to the mirror software and the vent button can be found in the bottom right. Um, you can kind of see down here, uh, there's a slight cutoff um, on the screen. So I'm going to vent the chamber. And right now, if you're in the room, you may hear it. Um, we have nitrogen entering the chamber to bring it up to atmosphere. So one thing that we'll need to do is uh, always wear gloves. Um, so gloves should be provided in the room. We'll use these uh, nitrile powder free. Um, if you're an MC squared user, please use our gloves. Uh, otherwise, do make sure that you get powder free. Um, otherwise, you'll leave powder all over your sample that you're going to see. Um, I also have a 1.5 millimeter Allen wrench that I'll use to fix the sample into the chamber. Um, and that's really just about all I need. Uh, sometimes we have some stub tweezers so that you can grab your stub. However, my stub is a little bigger, so those tweezers won't work for that. I'm going to switch over to the chamber view. Okay, so venting is complete, um, and now what you see is the sample stage. Um, real quick here, um, uh, if you look at the stage window, the last user should have left this at our loading position, which is X equals minus 215 millimeter, Y equals zero millimeter, and Z equals 60 millimeter. So uh, this is with the stage all the way down, uh, closest to the door and in the center position. Um, tilt, of course, should be zero. Um, but uh, in this WD and Z right now does not matter, and I'll explain that in a minute. Um, you can see a view here of the uh, internal chamber camera. Uh, so if you put my hand there you can see it's a live view of the chamber so I'm gonna go back to the uh, chamber view from the external okay so what I'm gonna do is load the sample right here in the center um, so if you're operating the rise or the mirror 95% um, of the operation will be the exact same uh, one thing that separates the rise from the Mira, uh, rise means Raman and Sim. So I have this uh, objective lens from the Raman system there. Uh, it's very important that, that you not um, touch that, hit it with your sample, etc. So we want to make sure that we give that lots of space. Uh, I've loaded the sample right in the center of the stage. Um, so one thing to keep in mind as you load your sample, if you have multiple samples and you would like to keep track of them, is that the top of the stage where I'm pointing here is 12 o'clock on the screen. This side of the stage closest to the operating uh, table 
here is six o'clock, the bottom of the screen. So I'm going to rotate my sample so that the uh, sample of interest is at the top. I'm gonna to put the one and a half millimeter Allen wrench in, and you can see I'm just using two fingers. I don't need to crank this down hard. I'm just applying actually uh, just enough tension to give electrical contact. Um, so it's not a mechanical um, clamping, it's just for electrical contact. So what I'm now gonna do is close the door and I'll hold my hand on it. And now I will click pump. The pump process is going to take about two to three minutes. Um, and what I'm going to do, um, just to show you, let's see, yeah, just to show you the button, I'm going to have to use the Windows magnifier, unfortunately. Um, but you can see at the bottom here, there's a pump and vent button. Standby is one you do not want to click. That's generally for uh, staff and supervisors. It's a way for us to idle the microscope for long periods. So your buttons will be pump and vent. We vented to load the sample and now we're pumping down. And you can see a readout of the chamber pressure. Uh, this red bar will progress towards the right and eventually turn green. Once it's green, we can begin operation. I am taking my gloves off, so please don't operate the microscope with gloves on. Mainly because then you'll be tempted to, um, with your gloves still on, touch the inside of the chamber when you remove your uh, sample. Um, so, while we are waiting, um, I'm going to show a couple things. Um, so this is the UI, or the user interface. Um, we have the scanning window. Um, obviously the webcam window and the hand panel window don't show up in the user interface. That's just for the streaming session. We have a stage control window and we have the chamber view. So this is the internal view. Um, I'm now going to change the X position to zero and you'll start to see the sample move directly under the electron column pole piece. Um, so that is a live view that's always running. If the last user did not leave these windows up, and part of our shutdown procedure is to make sure the sample or the, sorry, the SEM um, is in a state that's good for the next user, but sometimes people forget. So these windows can be closed, they can be minimized, etc. Uh, you can find them here in the top right. So I'll bring the stage control back up, bring the IR window back up. There are two IR windows. This one is okay to close. This, this larger one shows the Raman objective. And then finally, I can click the scanning window. Um, for the purposes of training, I am going to zoom this out and make it a little smaller. Uh, you can sort of see in the bottom right um, that the uh, bar is still red, so we're still waiting. So if you do have a question, um, make sure that you just add it to the chat window. I will monitor that as, as we're doing training here and um, we'll be able to answer your questions. Um, also, if you um, have your YouTube settings, uh, if, if you look in the bottom right, there's a gear icon and you want to click that and select 1080p uh, resolution. So that way all of the text on the screen will be readable for you. Uh, otherwise, YouTube downscales the resolution and it get, gets a little blurry. So if you're not set to high def, uh, please do set that to high def. Um, okay. Uh,
Okay, so we vented the chamber to load a sample. Um, after the chamber door opened, uh, we loaded and tightened the set screw. And um, I'm going to say tab uh, while wearing gloves. At that point, uh, we close the chamber door and clicked the pump icon. The pumping should take uh, two to three minutes, so we now are ready to go. It's it's in a good good position. Um, okay, so we can turn the beam on. Uh, right now, the beam is set to whatever the last user used, um, and when I I'm talking about beam settings. What I'm talking about here is high voltage and beam intensity. So this is the acceleration or the speed of the electrons, wavelength of the electrons. Uh, beam intensity is the probe current. It's, it's how tightly packed the, um, the beam is with electrons. So we see here high voltage and beam intensity. Uh, beam intensity, I can change up to 20. This is a dimensionless number where... Um, Oh, could show the set screw again. Um, yeah, so uh, Juwan, what I'll have to do is um, vent the chamber. Um, but what uh, we'll switch samples and then I can show the set screw again. Um, okay, so beam intensity. Um, 20 is for analytical work like EDS x-ray work or EBSD electron backscatter diffraction. So I'm using this knob here, the beam intensity knob. I also can click beam intensity and type a number in here. Uh, so beam intensity 10 is a good starting point for imaging. That's what we're going to use. High voltage goes from 0 to 30 kV. Uh, 30 kV is very high. So I'm going to start with 10 kV. Um, all modern SEMs work very well at lower voltages. Um, there's less interaction with the electron in your sample at lower voltages. Uh, 30 kV and high, high kV is, in my opinion, mainly for uh, electron backscatter diffraction and x-ray work. So I can turn the beam on now. We've set our initial conditions, which are high voltage 10 and beam intensity 10. So we see a dark circle here in the center and a bright white outline. I'm going to click this button that says auto contrast and brightness. Uh, so why don't I actually take a switch over here to the MUI. The MUI is the manual user interface. Uh, so we have a button. This is a touch screen. And so there's a button here for auto contrast and brightness. Uh, I use that pretty much every time just to get me in the ballpark. Uh, I can, of course, change contrast and brightness with these two knobs. We have contrast and brightness. Um, but often when I start, it's way, way out, so I'll just hit the auto. Um, the auto focus button, the center button here, honestly, is one that I never use. Uh, but I do also use the acquire image. Um, also on the MUI, we have our magnification knob, so we can zoom in and out. Uh, we have a working distance knob. Working distance is focus. So this is where we focus. Uh, again, beam intensity. As I go up, I'm getting a higher current. As I go down, I get a lower current. So you can see this is a very noisy image. Uh, so for today's training, I'm going to use beam intensity 10. Um, and then I also have a joystick. So I can move the sample around. Sorry, actually, let me show again the beam intensity. So Going up to beam intensity 20, we have a very high current, high signal image, but the resolution drops. If I go down to beam intensity 1, you see it's very noisy. Um, so I'm going to get some good signal to noise at 10. So that's what I'm going to use today. Uh, so the other is you can see the joystick does move the stage around. Uh, right now, what you're looking at is a platinum aperture. Um, I can zoom all the way out and we can sort of see some other samples. One nice feature of the test scan, both the mirror and the rise, is we have what we call field mode. It's an ultra low magnification. So now I can see all of my samples. Uh, just with using this a lot, I know what I have. I have some gold on carbon here at the top for high resolution imaging. Uh, we're going to use a lot of this sample here on the left. 
Uh, this is 10 balls on a carbon substrate. Uh, we have some copper uh, TEM grids and then finally a silicon measurement wafer. Uh, this over here is a, a plastic sample for uh, flipping the beam around and taking a mirror image. Uh, we're mainly going to use the sample here on the left. Uh, I do have the option also of wide field mode. So here you can now see the whole entire stage. So if you lose your sample or you have multiple samples in and you're not sure which one uh, you're looking at, choose wide field mode. Um, wide field has a maximum magnification which I can read here of 27 times I can see it here in the data bar of the image I cannot go higher I'm turning the knob nothing happens um, field mode has a low magnification but also has a high uh, it's gonna be a few thousand though I think I think it's 5,000 uh, yeah so that's maximum 5,000 so Generally, I will only use wide field or field mode for navigating my sample. Or if I, for some reason, have a really large sample, I, I want in one field of view. Um, all of my imaging will be done in resolution mode. So I, this, uh, this little window, by the way, stays connected to the scanning window. Um, so we have a button for the different modes here. So we're going to use... Uh, the 10 ball sample so i'm going to zoom up right away we can see okay the image is too bright uh, i'm going to turn down the brightness a little bit uh, i could even use that auto contrast and brightness again a little too dark and the image is out of focus so i can use the working distance knob and bring my image into focus now if you look at the ir camera the distance here is way too large um, if you see all the various detectors, they kind of point to a spot that's 15 millimeters below the pole piece. So we need to bring our sample up. So um, what I'm going to do is just do a coarse focus. And you see as I'm focusing this number here, working distance and Z, is changing. So working distance and Z is different than stage Z. This is a global stage position. This position is a linked distance of the uh, focal point of the, the microscope. So I'm roughly in focus now. So I know that my sample is around 60 millimeters away from the pole piece. It is safe for me just to now type in. I'm not gonna go straight to 15 because I'll have depth of focus issues. Uh, let's, let's go to 25 and refocus. So I clicked 25 and working distance in Z and you see now the sample moving upwards here. So while that happens, um, so we clicked the pump. After back, okay. Selected our beam conditions. For, for our case, um, this was 10, uh, 10 kV and beam intensity um, 5. We clicked um, beam on to begin uh, accelerating and then we found, roughly found, our region of interest. We do a force focus to find where our sample is. Uh, type today. Uh, and then we're going to uh, move the sample to 15 millimeter working distance because that's where we're going to image. Uh, so if we go back to the mirror, uh, 25. So you see, even though I was focus at, in focus at 60, I'm a few hundred micron off just because of the change of depth of focus. So I'm going to do this one more time. I'm going to course focus, and I'm ignoring all the beam alignments. I'm not going to do beam alignments until I'm at 15 millimeter. So one more time now, this time to 15. 
So of course, in an electron microscope, I can take pictures at any working distance. Um, 15 millimeter is where, uh, 15 millimeter working distance is where I'm gonna have the best collection deficient efficiency from all of my detectors. Okay. So now we're pretty close. We're right at 15. So I can zoom out. And because, I don't know if you notice, uh, way down at 60, we could see the whole uh, 10 on carbon sample. Um, now I can only see a small portion uh, because the beam is not able to sweep as far at this short working distance. So at this point, what I wanna do is now do my beam alignments because I am at my intended uh, working distance. So there are, for standard imaging, there are two main alignments, the gun tilt alignment and the column centering, which is actually an objective lens alignment. So I'm gonna do the gun tilt alignment first. So when I select here, high voltage, the last thing that I use, this is the, the pad focus. In the list, let's choose gun tilt. And now, uh, let me actually go back over to the MUI. You see that this pad has changed where we were, say maybe at something like stigmators, whatever the pad focus is in the Mira UI will change what the MUI is controlling. So right now we're going to use gun tilt and there's, it's a two axis alignment. So we have an X axis and Y axis. Let's go back over to the Mira. Um, and simply what I'm doing, you see as I turn clockwise, the image gets really poor. So now I'm gonna go back through the alignment point, goes poor again. So I'm iterating back and forth until I find what looks to be the sharpest point. I'm gonna do the same thing in the Y. Um, this is a little different than the way we do it on our thermo or FEI microscopes where we're looking for brightest spot. Uh, here we're looking for sharpest image and that should be okay. Uh, so now my gun alignment is done. This is less critical at, say, a beam intensity of 10 than at beam intensity of 20. At a beam intensity of 20, um, gun tilt becomes very critical to get the maximum current. So uh, we've done that, and now we need to do our objective centering. If you notice as I'm going through focus, uh, the alignment's actually not terrible right now, so it's, it's less obvious. Let me make it a little worse. Um, Okay, make it way worse. So now you see as I focus, we have this swinging in the image. That means that my beam is not centered in the electron uh, final lens, the objective lens. So I'm gonna choose this option here, the manual centering wizard. So it's on this uh, scanning tab, like that, and it brings up a small pop-up window. Um, we're going to click next, and what's happening now is the microscope is automatically wobbling for us. Wobbling means that it's, it's going up and down in focus. So it's as if I'm turning the knob back and forth. What I want to do at this point is use these two knobs, X and Y, and change from a swinging in the image to just a pulsing in and out as it goes in and out of focus. So I'm gonna start with X first, so you see here we have some diagonal movement. I'm going counterclockwise with the knob until we just have vertical movement. And now I'll use the Y knob and remove that vertical movement. So now it's, you see it's getting worse here. That means I wanna go back the other way. And that's, that's pretty good. So now what's happening, instead of, instead of swinging as we go through focus, it just pulses in and out of focus, which means that the electron beam is nicely centered in the lens field. So it's okay to click finish. And then now one last time, we're gonna do a fine focus. Okay, uh, one thing that you may have noticed is I occasionally bring up what we call a reduced raster window. 
this shows up uh, just by double clicking the left mouse button. Whenever I'm in this image and I double click, I'll have this reduced raster window show up. Um, it's centered around the location that I double clicked. To make it go away, I double click again. I can click left click once in the middle and move it. I can also right click in the middle and resize it. So I use this often as a focusing aid. So for example, we can tell right now we have some astigmatism in the image. Um, again, I'm going to make that worse so that you can really see it. Right? Everything is stretched now. In, uh, actually, my uh, camera seems to be mirrored. So it's stretched in this direction. And then as I go through focus, it gets blurry. And now it's stretched in this direction here. Uh, so this is beam astigmatism. Um, so we see it here in a much more slight manner. So I'm going to correct for the beam astigmatism and um, then we can finally start taking some images. So let's just again do a little rundown. We move the sample to 15 millimeter. Um, at that point, we did a fine focus. Gun tilt alignment. We uh, corrected the X, Y axis alignment for sharpest image. And then we did the um, objective lens alignment. That's with the manual centering wizard. And we um, remove sample swinging during focus wobble. So now our last step before we're ready, we really have, have three more steps. Uh, we need to do a fine focus. Uh, we need to do a stigmatism correction and then finally set our contrast and brightness and we can start to acquire images. Um, so, um, fine focus really just means focusing at a higher magnification. So the overall changes will be much less. So as I focus back and forth, you can see there is some astigmatism in the image. So if we look at this feature here, it's sharp on the left and right, and it's blurry at the top and bottom. As I go through the focal point to the other side, it's now blurry on the left and right and more sharp on the top and bottom. Uh, so this is just a telltale indication of beam astigmatism. Uh, you can think of astigmatism as the shape of the electron beam. So instead of being a nice circular profile, the probe is a um, some sort of ellipse. So um, what I'm going to do is use the stigmator function and we'll correct again in the x-axis and y-axis. So I have a couple options. I can click stigmator here or I can come through the pad focus function here and click stigmators. Either one will bring stigmators to the knob bank. Uh, and just like focusing, I'm going to do the x-axis and the y-axis. Um, I don't know if you can tell. So this is moving way too fast when I turn the knob. I'm barely turning the knob, right? So let me come here. I'm barely turning the knob and I'm getting big changes. Um, the center knob on the MUI of these this three knob um, row controls the step size or how fast the knobs um, affect the setting. Nine is as fast as big steps as we can take. So one is as small. Uh, I'm going to do something like say four right now. And now when I go back to the mirror, you can see I turn the knob more times to get the same Turn it down even one more time. Okay. All right. So now, as I remove that beam astigmatism, 
the image sharpens up dramatically. Okay. Um, so if we go back to our, our summary here, um, we then did a um, iteration between focus and stigmation correction. And at that point, uh, the beam is as sharp as it's going to be. It's, it's shaped well, and we can acquire an image. Um, this, we're, we're not quite ready yet here because the contrast and brightness now is not right. Um, the background is too dark. The, we have certain features here that are um, saturating, so we need to get a better contrast and brightness. This, um, this specific image, the contrast is too high. So I need to turn the contrast down. Uh, contrast is a multiplicative function, so it also affects the brightness. Brightness is just additive. We're just adding or removing signal. Um, so I'm going to set contrast somewhere like that. Um, you see we're not saturating these small particles anymore. Um, we still have some bright edges around the edge of these particles, but that really has to do with the electron sample interaction. Um, an appropriate brightness and contrast in SEM will look to your eye to be a little low contrast. Um, just naturally, I think our brains like high contrast images. Uh, but if I were to take this to image J or Photoshop, uh, I'm not losing any information because I'm not saturating the detector. Now with the contrast too high, I've lost all feature uh, here in the center of these particles. There's nothing I could do in a digital analysis software to bring that back. So uh, you need to acquire images that are not saturating the detector. Um, so we also have a um, scan speed function here. Scan speed one operates very fast. Scan speed 10 scans painfully slow, so slow we actually can't even see it now. So let me come to like eight. Yeah, we see it here is where the scan line is still really slow. Um, as we scan slower, we give the detectors more time to collect signal. So what we're doing is we're increasing our signal to noise ratio. Of course, it lowers our uh, refresh time. So for me, I often do my alignments at a very fast scan. I'm going to navigate the beam around the sample using a fast scan. And then if I find an area I would like to capture an image at, I'm going to go to slow speed. Um, so for this specific sample, maybe scan speed 6 is a good uh, way to be. So let's set that up. If I come to SEM and image parameters here, here I can choose two things. The resolution of my saved image. My live window that I've been working in is uh, 1024 pixels by 1024 pixels. Um, the save window, as soon as I click this acquire image button, let's go ahead and hit it, you see is a much larger image. So um, it's a square rule. So a, a 2048 by 2048 image is four times as large as 1024. Um, and let's cancel this. I actually probably should have set up temporary user. Um, I'm going to set up a folder for training. Training. And this is going to be our 2048 image. Um, so effectively, with the pixel size, you're adjusting your sampling rate. Uh, so we can very easily oversample an image where we just have too many pixels. Uh, one thing that a large pixel count does let me do is later I can go back and if I if I like I can crop an area out um, and I'll have more pixels in that cropped area. For today's purposes I am going to change the save window to also be 1024. Here in the acquisition we can set our scan speed. So a 1024 save window with a scan speed of 6 
is going to take 43 seconds to acquire. So now, even if I'm scanning quickly, as soon as I click the acquire button, we see the scan speed has changed to six. And we have a little countdown here of how long this picture will take to acquire. If I don't like what I see, I can click break and the acquisition will stop. Uh, I often do that if I see a lot of contamination, if I don't like my brightness and contrast settings, I'm not gonna collect the whole image. I'm just gonna stop it and fix my problem. But we'll let this one acquire. This window that pops up uh, automatically pops up every time and you can choose notes here if you would like. What this does is it creates a um, data file that goes hand in hand with your image that has all of your SEM parameters saved. I generally just click through here and say okay. And now let's change this to a 1024 as the name 1024. Um, and what I'm going to do, temporary user files. Let's see, where are those? I think they might be documents, temporary user files, training. Okay, so this is that file that maintains all of your SIM parameters. Um, and here is our image file. The 2048 image, if I look at the properties of it, is a 10 megabyte file, 9.5. So we would expect the 1024 to be one fourth that. And we see it's a 2.4 megabyte file. Um, so your, as you double the X and Y axis of your pixel size, you quadruple the size of the image. If we were to acquire a 4096, that would be 16 times as large as the 1024. Uh, so this is all personal preference. It's whatever you decide you want. Uh, I'm going to today acquire 1024. Personally, I most often acquire 1024s. Okay. So this saved window, um, as we save or as we acquire new pictures, we get a new save window pop up. It's okay to just close these. So they're, they're being saved into our folder. Okay, so now uh, if we were doing some, some research, what we would do is find a feature of interest. Uh, we would zoom up on that feature of interest and take a picture. Um, there are two things I think to, that you need to really pay attention to when you do this. Um, set a uniform acquisition. So that way you can easily uh, compare your data from one day to the next. So to do that, you either want to use standard magnifications. I uh, always advocate instead of magnification to use view field. So if I click here where you see view field, this is a 7.5 micron view field. So I might type in 10 micron. Um, Actually, so this brings up a point, um, some other user, I usually like to have field of view in the data bar. Some user has changed that. We are a multi-user lab. Uh, people will change things in the software for their own settings and um, we want to go back. So what I'm going to do, tools, I'm going to find, maybe it's here, preferences, hmm, interesting options, somewhere there will be a data bar, resets your information, Maybe here in the options, no. Okay, this is something I'll just have to explore later. Usually it's somewhere in the um, preferences. 
but we will look at that later. Okay. So, um, so for me, I'm going to generally always take a field of view setting. Uh, the reason is if I, if I save a hundred micron field of view, uh, just by looking at the size of the image, I can quickly make inferences about the size of the particles. Um, so I don't have to really look at the, the data bar, micron bar. Um, other people, though, it, it will give you weird magnification numbers. So this says 2.7. Um, so 2,770. If you choose, you can also just say click 5,000x, 10,000x, etc. Oh, that took me to a million. Um, so for me, I'm going to check field of view, and now we could acquire an image again. So a 5 micron field of view is giving me a 55.4 kx magnification image. We'll let that acquire. Oh, here we have field of view. Maybe I just couldn't see it on the other because I didn't um, scroll down. So I click through here, and I'm just going to give this some sort of name. So my standard, um, my standard method of operation when I save images, I usually put in this in the file name the parameters that went into creating the image um so this is a uh, five micron field of view five um fov this is the secondary electron detector so i have a 10 kv team 10 beam intensity five micron field of view secondary electron image and i'm going to save that uh we do have other detectors so what i'm going to do now is um put in the backscatter detector and we will look at the difference between backscatter and secondary. So here, uh, on the right-hand side, we have two backscatters, motorized retractable backscatter and motorized water-cooled retractable backscatter. Two separate ones. The water-cooled is only used if you have the heating stage. So I'm going to click the button push in on the motorized. You see there, our sample kind of dances a little bit because of the vibration. I'm going to make this larger. And you can see here, the detector starting to come into view. The backscatter detector enters underneath the pole piece and above your sample. It will restrict your working distance. So if you're close, you can hit the backscatter very easily and damage it, and they are very expensive. So please uh, be careful when you insert the backscatter detector. Um, I don't know if you can tell a couple things happened. Um, it added a little bit of beam astigmatism. Uh, you know, it's got metallic parts, so maybe, maybe that had some effect on the beam. So I am going to correct that astigmatism again, or stigmation. Um, and it also affected the contrast and brightness a little bit. Not much, but uh, the backscatter detector absorbs and blocks uh, line of sight for some of the secondaries. Okay, so the secondary electron image, um, you know, if you remember from the SIM intro seminars, is a um, signal that's very sensitive to topography. Um, the backscatter is very sensitive to density. So if I change over here from secondary electron mode to backscatter mode, suddenly again, let me do the auto contrast and brightness. you see we have very bright features on a dark background. So these are 10 spheres on a carbon substrate. So obviously the sample is way heavier than the background. So these particles will be much brighter than the background. Uh, if you look over here uh, on the left-hand side on this particle, we have some kind of medium gray, um, which if we go back to secondary electron mode, looks pretty close in grayscale 
to everything else. But when I go to backscatter mode, it's darker. Uh, honestly, this is probably just some sort of debris. But it does show that it's a different, uh, has a different average Z, average atomic number, than the particle. Um, let's demonstrate. Um, there is a difference between the maximum resolutions of the secondary electron and a backscatter image. Um, and that has nothing to do with the incoming electron beam. It has to do with the um, depth from which the, sam the signal comes. So in a secondary electron image, here I'm at 100,000 X. Uh, we have fairly sharp edges. If I go to a backscatter electron image, you can see right away that it gets uh, a little, little blurrier. Uh, so if I come to secondary electron, we ha see much uh, finer features in the background. I go just simply over to backscatter, a lot of those features disappear. Um, the backscatter uh, electrons are higher energy, so as the electrons hit your sample, uh, they, they come from a farther range than the secondary electrons, which really just come from maybe um, 200 angstroms near where the sample, uh, the electron interacts with your sample. Okay, I'm going to go back to field mode because we are going to navigate around a little bit. Let's actually even go to wide field mode. Um, if I use the backscatter detector, you can see this platinum aperture now is glowing much brighter. Back to resolution. So I, I happen to know that... This is a platinum aperture. This is a aluminum stub. But there's something on this here that is uh, lighter than platinum, heavier than aluminum. So I might, I might want to figure out what that is. Um, and one of the best ways to do that is with the EDS detector. Um, so now what I'm going to do is insert the EDS detector and take some, um, some spectra from this area and see if we can figure out, okay, what is that material? Um, so let me switch over. So this is another PC that's that's um, has a monitor just above the Mira PC. Um, I'm going to click the team icon to launch the software. Uh, this is EDAX team. Uh, you're going to hear the homing of the EBSD detector, and then um, this all you know takes about a minute or so for the software to fully boot up. Uh, actually, while we're doing that, let's make another folder. Uh, folder, and we're gonna call it training. Oops, caps lock is on. Training. The MC2 users, great because that's where we're going to want to save our data. On occasion, um, it, the software hangs, so just come find a staff member and we can help you reset it if it doesn't uh, boot up in a meaningful time. I guess what we can do while we're waiting on that, let's um, let's just kind of update our list here. Uh, so we we did uh, fine focus and stigmation correction. Uh, after that, we adjusted brightness and contrast, and then at that point we acquired images. We can also insert um, the backscatter def um, detector, BSD, and we can take images with that as well. So now uh, we've moved around and I want to find out what, that, uh, what those features are. Um, let's see, what I'm going to do is we're gonna log in with our standard login, username MC2. The password is the one that 
you should already know if you don't ask a staff member. And there are multiple um, detector functions that we can select here. I'm going to do just EDS today. So I can select EDS and log in. Here are a lot of names of other people. We're going to create a project that's called training. Our sample is the standard sample. And now what I'll have on the, the uh, data tree on the left is the project name, training, and standard sample. So um, I need to do a couple things. I'm not ready to collect data yet. First, uh, I can see by looking here that the detector is not cooled down. So I'm going to double click, and that's going to begin cooling the sample. Uh, sorry, cooling the detector. So let me make sure that that looks like that's happening. Oops, select that, cooling on. Okay, so it, this is a silicon drift detector, an SDD, um, and it needs to be cooled uh, by a Peltier cooler so that uh, we don't damage it when we hit it with x-rays. So now this is turned green, and here our um, indicator, oh, it looks like it went back to yellow, so maybe it needs another second. What you'll notice, uh, very important numbers are here. One is input CPS, that's counts per second. Um, oh, I see a question from Juan. Uh, Juan. Can I explain how to measure the diameters uh, of the spheres? And I can definitely do that. Um, so uh, let's do that while we're waiting for the detector to cool down. The detector should cool down in um, just a few seconds. Uh, let's go back to our hand panel. Okay, so I'm going to go back to field mode. That way I can see easily where I'm going. So let's drive over back to the spheres. Aha. Okay. And I thought something was weird. Just so you guys know, um, I was pretty sure when I loaded this sample that I put our 10, 10 spheres at the top or 12 o'clock. Uh, but as I push the joystick left and right, the image is moving up and down. A previous user left scan rotation on. Unfortunately, this is just something we have to try to deal with, um, that users will configure the microscope for their own use, and um, they often just forget, honestly. Go back to secondary electron mode. So uh, you often will come in and find things in a, a configuration that, you know, isn't quite right. So it's good to know how to fix those things. So let me go back and now refocus one more time. I still see a little bit of astigmatism. Um, it's not uncommon for there to be something, sometimes these screws get magnetized, the set screws, because uh, they're in high magnetic fields. Uh, so over time, they just magnetize. And what happens then is you move the stage around this source of astigmatism. Um, will change how it interacts with the beam. Okay, so we want to measure some of these. And what we can do is in the top right here, um, there's a button for the measurement panel. So I can click show measurement panel. Um, there are various options. The one that I use most often is just this one. This is a point-to-point -point measurement. So I'm going to click the left side to the right side. It will show on screen the measurement and click here again so I could get a distribution of images this is of uh, measurements from our image this is on the live image though so what I'm going to do instead uh, let's change our view field just so I have uniformity to 50 micron and you see that changing the magnification did not change the measurement I'm gonna, let's delete these guys. And I'm going to do this from a saved image. Okay, so now our image is saved. Um, 
So we say, okay, I'm going to, let's see, this is 10 kV, 50 micron field of view this time. And it's an SED image. Uh, so one more time, I'll show you. We click here in the top right at the show measurement panel. And there it is. And I'm going to choose here the point to point measurement. And I can measure across. Um, I also have the option. Uh, let's see if I hover. Does it say what these are? No. So this measurement. Oh, I see. Oops, let's delete that. So if I draw a line, it's kind of a tangent to the edge of that circle, and I put another parallel line there, it's going to measure the distance from one line to the next. Um, let's just call it sphere one. And that's going to now show up in this list, and I can actually save this table. So um so i could do the same thing over and over again and measure click measure oops move that um so every time i do that i now get a um, measurement here if i click save table it's going to save a text file so let's do that measurements and let's also again now save this one more time so we're going to save the image and i'm going to call this uh overlay so let's go look at those oops okay do windows explorer um okay, training so here's the measurement file so it's simply just the name and the measurements um, and if we look at the 50 micron image, so here's our image with no overlay. And you see that the overlay does uh, stay. So um, just remember that if you have the auto save feature on and you have measurements in your image, those will be burnt into every image going forward. Um, Honestly, this is something that you can do with uh, very simply with ImageJ. Um, ImageJ is a freeware image analysis software uh, that's been used in the industry for a long time. Um, when you open up your image, you calibrate to this data bar, and then you can measure and gain statistics that way. Um, and the bonus there is you're not paying for microscope time to make these measurements. I, I think the on-screen measurement tool is great uh, just to give you an idea of of the size of some of these features. Uh, but if you really want to do a lot of particle measurements, I do suggest something like uh, ImageJ. So yeah, so I could measure a lot of these. These guys are just point-to-point -point measurements. Um, I have the option of making... Oops. need to move that. So if I click one edge, uh, here I can get radius information, but none of that shows up in the table unless I'm working off of a saved image. Okay, so our um, detector is now um, is now cooled down. So let's go over to the EDS again. Um, I'm going to go back to the platinum aperture. Oops. Okay, so really quick, we're here in the mirror software, back on the platinum aperture. If I look in the backscatter image again, uh, I see that there are, at the very least, uh, three distinct um, compositions here. Um, so let's go back to EDAX. Um, you know, okay. Uh, so there are a couple things I can do. Um, I can utilize that reduced raster window. 
And um, so if we look at the Mira software, I now have this reduced raster window just on the, the background. Um, and uh, Juan, yes, there is a, a shortcut. Uh, he asks, is there a shortcut to acquire the image? Uh, that's here. That's what we've been pushing is the acquire image button here. So this is a touch panel. So every time I want to acquire an image, I just hit that button. Um, and you see now the image is acquiring. So uh, I'm going to, well, we might as well acquire this one so that we can see. Personally, this, uh, the contrast is too high here. Uh, so I would turn that contrast down if we're going to acquire it again. I didn't really pay attention to view field or magnification. I just hit acquire. Um, we're just going to call this BSD1. Uh, so let me close this real quick then. And I'm going to turn that contrast down a little bit and turn the brightness up and the contrast up a little bit more. But again, this is, this is that case where an appropriate brightness and contrast for an electron micrograph is going to be a little lower contrast than, than your brain might like. So again, I hit the shortcut button here, which is just on the edge of this uh, touch panel. Okay, so that image is now acquired. Um, and I'm not really, again, paying attention to view field or magnification. I just changed contrast and brightness. We'll just call that BSD2. Okay. Uh, so I can put this reduced raster window here on the background. Um, and now if I go over to the EDAX software, I can collect a spectrum. Uh, I have zero counts, um, and that reason is that the uh, EDS detector is very sensitive to um, the IR light, so I'm going to right-click this image and turn the IR light off. So back here. And um, also the detector is retracted. So I'm going to click the insert button, move in. And now our counts are something reasonable. Um, this is a silicon drift detector. They can handle high count rates. Um, so this is actually my dead times low. So what I would do is turn the beam intensity up. Uh, but let's just collect a quick spectrum. We're at 10 kV, so we will get no x-rays higher than 10 kV. Uh, so if I zoom up, you can see it starts to drop off there. Um, I have a name for this. It's called the Duane Hunt Limit. Um, just kind of simple that you cannot have any x-rays higher than your incoming electron beam. Uh, this green progress bar needs to finish before I start doing any um, line identification. One of the classic mischaracterizations in EDS is the identification of bromine. It overlaps directly. Let's get rid of that. Overlaps directly with aluminum. So turn bromine off. Uh, so we can also look here and say, okay, what is that? Looks like there's some copper seen there. Um, so I would check also the K-alpha peak. I don't really see anything from copper. Like here, what could this be? Oxygen, I believe. And beryllium, I don't believe. But this could be another peak. There's aluminum L. We'll leave that one alone. Um, okay, so this is clearly an aluminum background. Uh, if I go back over to the Mira software, um, and then I can move here. 
and acquire again. This I expect to be platinum. A zirconium. So again, we're waiting here for this uh, green progress bar to finish. Uh, the reason is there are automatic identification routines that run. So if I, it just keeps disappear, disappearing on me when I click. Okay. Um, let me, boy. So here now we see platinum, we see iridium. That actually the iridium is possible. Um, usually these electron apertures are a platinum iridium alloy. We have some aluminum that's probably just noise from the stub. Carbon, of course, as always. Oxygen. I can here again and yep. So we have platinum. And then the last question that we had was what is this medium gray? So I'm going to move the reduced raster area onto that. And now, one more time, collect a spectrum. We'll let this acquire. And just as we watch, it looks like we're seeing uh, silver, which makes total sense. It's probably just the standard silver paint that we use to stick our samples on the stub. Um, there's a lot of other small peaks. Uh, it says sulfur. Um, of course, that makes sense because sil silver does sulfidize. Uh, fluorine, silicon, aluminum. So the um, silver paint is in a lacquer. Um, and if we go back, so here's our sample. If we zoom up, um, you can see, obviously, it's not pure silver. There's a lot of other stuff in there, a lot of other small features. Um, there's some very dark features that appear to be actually holes. So um, we've solved our mystery using EDS. We know that this is a platinum aperture on an aluminum substrate that was held down with silver paint. Um, I can also do uh, x-ray maps so we can look at the spatial distribution of that. I'm actually not going to do that today. Um, what we'll do is if, if you have interest in collecting spectral maps, line profiles, uh, doing quantification, uh, that's something that we'll talk about offline. Um, okay. I'm going to pull the EDS detector back out. Um, actually, you know what I should do um, is show. Let's move that detector back in. Uh, I, I actually do need to show you the uh, the effect of the beam intensity on the X-ray counts uh, because that is important to do a nice setup. Um, so if I look at the x-ray software, we see this number here reported dead time. Uh, you know, it, it has to do with the electronics of how we convert input counts into output counts seen in the uh, spectrum. And we have a certain amount of dead time uh, because, so the x-ray hits the detector chip and that gives off a voltage which fills a, a buffer and effectively that buffer needs to be flushed every now and then. Um, so dead time is the amount of time sent, spent refreshing those electronics. Um, to get the optimal signal, we wanna have a dead time around 30%. So this is a percentage. Uh, what I'm gonna do is, um, just turn the beam intensity number. So if we look here, um, I'm going to just turn the beam intensity number up. But what we want to watch as I do that is the dead time percentage. So now 
Uh, we're at beam intensity 12, dead time's gone up to 20. Beam intensity 16, dead time is 30. And you see our counts have gone up to 15,000 counts per second. Uh, so if I go back to beam intensity 10, we have around 3,000 counts per second. So uh, by increasing our beam intensity, oops, um, we're getting many more counts. So here we're up at beam intensity 17. And we're at about a 35% dead time with a 20,000 count per second uh, input. And I, on the Mira software, uh, so I'm just averaging. So I'm scanning over the whole area. So we'll just get an average now of the silver, the platinum, the aluminum uh, all together. And what will happen is we have a much nicer uh, input, so we'll have a better signal to noise ratio. Um, there is something kind of important that I want to show though. Um, so we'll wait again for this green bar. Not likely that we have cadmium, so that's not what that is. Okay, so acquisition is totally done. Uh, zirconium is a no. We know that that is instead uh, platinum. So the platinum, uh, I'm assuming M family overlaps with the zirconium L family. I uh, don't believe we have cadmium. We can click here and we do believe copper. So we need to figure out what this peak is. So if I click that, the closest match is argon. We know that there is not argon in the sample. So what we're actually getting there is a double peak of aluminum. So we're, we've now increased our input counts so high that every now and then um, two aluminum x-rays hit the detector at once and the detector doesn't know. So basically all that happens is it's some energy hit the chip and the chip gives off some amount of voltage and we count that voltage. Um, so if two x-rays hit at the exact same time, that voltage is doubled. So it puts a count in a bin that's double. So if I click, if I left click here, um, this is showing 1480 EV. If I look at this peak, pretty much right on double the aluminum peak. So do be careful when you go to uh, analyze the um, the spectrum that you know you're thinking about things like double peaks. There are also escape peaks. Um, so again, we can help you. Staff members can help you to identify what's in your spectrum. Um, okay. So um, what I'm going to do is. Um, we can be done with the EDS. Uh, so let's turn the IR back on. I'm actually, so our detector is being retracted right now. So at this point, um, we've done the full setup. Really, if this were some a sample I were interested in, I might go around and measure um, different particles, take different images. Uh, here is a function that I do want to show. Uh, let's go back to secondary electron mode. Uh, this is, I mentioned earlier that this is a um, silicon alignment grid. Um, okay, uh, Min Jung asks, do we keep the accelerating voltage at 10 kV and just increase the, the beam intensity? Um, we can, th there are reasons to do both and I, I can show really quick uh, after I do this alignment um, why we might do both. Okay, so this is an etched silicon wafer. Um, and at times you may want to align your sample orthogonally. So what I can do is I can come here to the rotation and I can say, you know what, that looks like maybe, maybe it's a 20 degree. So I can rotate, but it actually wasn't 20 degrees. The easier thing to do, uh, and they kind of hide it a little bit on this UI, if we click this button that says define UV, uh, UV just meaning alternate coordinates, 
I'm going to click this button that says align sample and I'm going to do a stage rotation to align my sample horizontally. So I can click here, draw a line on the area that I'm interested in and now you can see that it automatically does the alignment for me. Uh, the sample is fairly dirty. Um, so it automatically does the alignment for me to align the features and you can see they're not perfectly aligned so let's do it one more time define uv align sample i'm going to click here draw a line click again and now it fixes that alignment uh, so let's measure let's find out what size is the uh are these hatch marks so i'm going to use the point to point measurement so when I measure something like the hatch marks, I'm not going to measure the center to the center. It's way easier for me to measure pitch to pitch, which means left side to left side or right side to right side. Um, and that's really hard to see. Um, so let's delete that. Um, I'm going to do a quick acquisition and then we'll do it on the, the acquired image. The standard sample we've had for many years so everything you see on the surface really just comes from sample handling um, so you do want to be very careful always handle your samples with gloves um, keep them as clean as possible store them ideally uh, they're better stored in metal containers some plastics can outgas and leave hydrocarbons on the surface of your sample uh, okay and actually or let's just say silicon wafer. Okay, so now I'm going to do again this peak or pitch to pitch. So left side to left side, and it says still can't read that. So um, let's use this one. That'll put it in the table. So I draw a line here, and now I have a parallel line. I'll bring out here 99.88 micron. So this is a 100 micron grid. We'll go top to top 99.88 again so that's really good um, so the industry standard is is three percent uh, but we can often really beat that meaning that as long as this measured anywhere from 97 to 103 percent that's okay um, but most often we are uh, within one percent or less 99.95 and i actually did not get that angle quite right 99.99 so our measurements are pretty good there um, i could also try to figure out what is the measurement on um, the small square i measure the left and the right and it is a 9.9 .9 or 10 micron square okay So I'm actually going to go, just to answer the question about um, voltage versus beam intensity in x-ray, uh, I am going to go back to this sample because the, the sample that's going to help us out the most there is this uh, platinum aperture. If I truly didn't know what this aperture was, um, let me go ahead and I'm going to go back up to the EDAC software. And uh, so we're looking at this aperture. Oops, let's insert the detector. And let's turn off the IR LED. Okay, so we're going to acquire again. You see, our dead time is much higher. We were at 35 when we averaged everywhere, but platinum is a very, um, very strong, uh, has a strong X-ray yield high backscatter yield so the signal is just greater coming off of that platinum so we're at a dead time of 43 percent um if if i didn't know that this was platinum versus zirconium uh, so again let me come here and bit of platinum iridium we look at zirconium it wouldn't be unreasonable for me to think this is zirconium so what i would want to do to determine is it zirconium or is it platinum is actually look at the higher 
lines, the higher energy lines. So there should be a platinum line here up almost at 9 something kV, 9.4. Uh, we don't have enough beam voltage. So it doesn't matter how much beam intensity I gave it right now, I would never be able to excite that line. So what I'm going to do, uh, there's a concept, we, we refer to it as over voltage. You want at least 50% more uh, high voltage than a, the x-ray line you're trying to see. So if we want to see a 10 kV x-ray, we need to have a 15 kV high voltage. Um, so let's, let's do that. Oops, wrong one. Let's go back here. And now I'm going to change the voltage. Um, I would do minimum 15. Let's do 20, 20 kV. Takes a short second for the voltage to settle. Uh, and I'm going to do a quick beam alignment again really quick here. Every time you change voltage or beam intensity, you should do a beam alignment. But when you get good at it, you'll go pretty quick. So with, we're going to do a focus. I can see a small swing, so I know my objective lens is not aligned. We're right at 15. That's good enough. So let me come to gun tilt. So again, I tilt in the X looking for the sharpest possible image. I tilt in the y-axis looking for the sharpest possible image. So I believe something like that will be good. And then now I can do the objective lens alignment. With the x-axis, I remove swinging that's horizontal. With the y-axis, I remove vertical swinging. And again, doesn't have to be perfect. Um, so you can see that you can very quickly realign the electron beam. So that took me 30 seconds. Um, so now we have a 20 kV beam. And I'm going to go back up to the EDAC software. Um, my dead time is now 84%, way too high. Um, so I do need to turn the beam intensity down. Uh, what's happened is that as we turn up the 20 kV, suddenly we're getting a lot more x-rays throughout the, the background, the Bremsstrahlung. We're getting a lot more characteristic x-rays. Um, so this is too high right now. So I'm going to turn down the beam intensity. There's one more trick I can do uh, where I can also change what we call amp time. Um, but right now, we're going to set the beam intensity to 11. Go back to EDAX. So now you see my dead time is 40%. I'm back at 12,000 pounds per second. So now as I acquire a spectrum, my Duane Hunt limit, the high level limit is at 20 kV like we expect. And suddenly I see these, um, this will be the L family peaks from platinum. Um, So let's let this acquire all the way through. And then we'll look at where the zirconium peaks would be. Um, so again, no bromine. We know that's not bromine. Um, if I look at zirconium, here at the tail end, we would expect a, I should see, if at 20 kV, I should see something at 16 kV. Uh, so we see no zirconium peaks, so this answers our question. Okay, we know for sure this is platinum. So um, the question of whether you keep the accelerating voltage at 10 kV and just increase the beam intensity, those, those two do two different things for you. Beam intensity will increase the amount of counts you get, and X-ray volt, or I'm sorry, high voltage will increase... Um, how many x-rays you can collect, meaning uh, what voltage range of x-rays you can collect. So a good range of dead time uh, generally is, is just always quoted as 30 to 40%. Um, so there are some other things I can do here. So if I know that 
maybe I'm going to do an x-ray map. And what I really want in an x-ray map is very high counts. I've got 12,000 counts per second, but I'm already at 40% dead time. So one thing I can do is I can change what we call my amp time. So the amp time has to do with those electronics again. Um, so the short answer is, let's run it really fast. Um, let's run it as fast as we can. Um, I'm going to turn the beam intensity up now. So by changing my amp time, I can now increase all the way up to beam intensity 20, and I'm still below 40% dead time but I have 260,000 counts per second. Uh, so now I'm getting a tremendously um, rich X-ray spectrum. I may have some um, peak doubling that I have to worry about, like this, this small hump here is likely the double peak of the Platinum M. Um, so if I look at that, that's a 2KV X-ray, and here's, you know, four. 4.1. So um, this small hump is probably double the platinum. But I don't know if you notice, the overall spectrum is much more smooth. Um, so that means that I'm getting a way better signal to noise ratio. So what I might want to do, I could always collect a map now that I have a tremendous amount of counts. Uh, let's look here quickly. We'll, we'll collect the um, image. So we see the aluminum background, we see the silver paint, and we see the aperture. And so what I would like to do when I do an x-ray map is, uh, general rule of thumb for x-ray maps is that you want as many counts as possible. So here I would change the amp time to allow for more beam current. Um, so let's look at EDS mapping. I'm going to do a low uh, resolution map just so you guys can see it. Um, and let's click collect. We want to confirm the elements after a quick preview because we want to make sure that it's not uh, mapping for anything crazy. So we do oxygen, aluminum, we see copper. We don't need zirconium. We already know that's not there. We did see some sulfur, maybe some chlorine. There might be some salt on the surface. Um, so click OK. And the view that you see now is, um, let me actually minimize this, is uh, what EDAX refers to as the phase map. I'm always much more interested in these other individual maps. So this is the oxygen map. So I can see there's some oxygen contained within probably the lacquer of this silver paint. Um, there's sulfur here, so probably the silver has sulfidized. And what's interesting is you also see a high sulfur peak at the platinum. I don't know that that's necessarily sulfur. Uh, platinum should be very inert. Um, this is just probably a increased background because the platinum is such a heavy um, x-ray emitter. Um, here again is that chlorine, probably same. Here's the silver. And copper is shown. So maybe there's some copper in the aluminum. Uh, so, you know, one thing we could do is we can make an overlay where here we can see, if I look at this key, this pi, aluminum is the blue. Uh, I, can, I can kick out the copper. Um, and honestly, these, we want to look at the aluminum, silver, and platinum. So we can do various overlays like that. Um, we'll click finish, and now our map is done. So the ideal dead time should between be between 30 
to 40%. Attempt to hit that target with your beam intensity first, and then if you need to, you can change the amp time of the detector. Uh, if you change the amp time, please change it back. Not a lot of users even look at amp time, and that can cause some weird artifacts. 7.68 gives the highest resolution. Um, so like when I refer to what I mean by resolution is the full width half max of the x-ray peaks. Um, so 7.68 gives the tightest x-ray peaks. Um, so let's remove that detector again. Go back here. Uh, we can turn on our IR LED. So now at this point, if I consider my SEM session done, I need to um, turn off the um, SEM or stop my session. I can't just vent. What I want to do, a couple things. First, I have to pull out the backscatter detector. Uh, like I mentioned, it's very sensitive. Um, and if you hit the backscatter detector, you can easily break it. So you want to make sure it's retracted because the next user may not notice that it's inserted. And if they put their sample in, they could hit it when they close the door. Um, okay, so we've fully retracted the backscatter detector. Uh, I'm now going to go to that position, minus 215x, y0, and 60z. And this is the loading position. So we can see here in the IR that um, everything's moving off one side. Uh, we obviously no longer see anything in the image. Um, technically, you know, we can see, like, if I go to, say, wide field mode and I turn the contrast up, so we can actually see parts of the stage. Um, The stage movement will be grayed out until it completes the movement you requested. So it's already at 215 and 0, and we're going down to 60. And at this point, it would be okay for me to uh, vent the chamber. Um, it is okay to leave the high voltage and beam intensity where you were, um, because there's really, it just changes depending on your sample. There is no standard you know if i really had to pick one maybe i would say 10 kb 10 beam intensity but um i'm going to now vent the chamber uh, oops looks like i've got to wait for the beam voltage to change first okay so while we're waiting for that um we can kind of go over our uh list that we were just building uh, so we inserted the backscatter detector, um, and after inserting the backscatter detector, we just acquired more images. Um, so a couple things that I'll make note of. Um, what I'm going to say is that we will um, align the beam after changing BI or high voltage. Um, High voltage will require more alignment change than beam intensity, but but both you should check. Um, and for EDS, we um, did a couple things. We pulled EDS detector in team software. Whoops. Um, we inserted the EDS detector. Uh, in the, actually, sorry, I keep saying Mira. This is the Rise, the test scan, right? In the test scan UI, we turned off the IR uh, LED light because that drowns out the EDS detector. And then set the beam intensity to achieve 30 to 40% dead time, and again now, acquire spectra or map, etc. cetera. Um, so when we finish with our uh, session, one, say, 
session over. We want to retract the backscatter detector and set the stage to uh, x equals minus 215 millimeter. y equals zero millimeter, z equals 60 millimeter. Uh, and again, um, like from the mirror software, I set the, this time the global stage z position to 60, not working distance in z. This is what I set after I've focused the image that measures from the pull piece. This is the global z position, so that's the one that I mean when I say uh, z equals 60. Um, so now we are free to vent and remove our sample. So let's go ahead and do that. Um, I'm going to come back here. And again, sorry, there's something weird going on with the uh, resolution. So I have to use the Windows um, magnifier just to show that at the bottom, here's where the pump and vent button is. So I click the vent button and it says vent the chamber. It always asks you just in case you accidentally hit it. Uh, so we say yes. Uh, so again, that button is down here, and that's where you vent the chamber. Uh, you can hear the turbo pump spinning down. You can hear um, nitrogen entering the chamber to bring it up to atmosphere. Um, let's go over to our chamber view. Oh, looks like I. We have another camera, and I think that it uh, have the batteries low, so it doesn't work. Live mode. Okay, so that camera um, battery got a little drained. So um, the main thing is that. Um, so again. We want to wear our nitrile gloves um, because we don't want to touch the sample without gloves on. Uh, even if you're done with the sample, wear gloves so that you don't accidentally touch the uh, microscope chamber or stage without gloves on. Um, so I'm going to use the 1.5 millimeter Allen wrench. Um, every every uh, microscope room should have them. I've got my stub tweezers. Um, so here we open up the door, and I'm going to make this a large view. So I insert the 1.5 millimeter Allen wrench, and I just have to really barely loosen it, and I can remove my session or my my sample. Um, so if I were loading another sample, right, we would just drop it into, um, here. I'm going to maybe just for purposes play. Oh, wrong. Okay, stop. based on the position of the camera, tilting doesn't really help much. Um, I thought I might be able to tilt towards the chamber. So, so if I were loading, right, we just do a slight tightening of the set screw, and that's now secured my sample. So my sample is no longer loose. It's, it's in there pretty secure. But, you know, I'm again only going finger tight I'm not really cranking it down because um, it's very easy to strip these screws out. We'll close this up. We'll crank this back down. 
And now I'm going to click pump in the bottom right and pump down to high vacuum. Okay, and uh, so Min Jiang asks, will there be another hands-on training session? So um, obviously we have, um, we have to follow the COVID guidelines. And part of that is that we can't be for extended periods um, within six feet of each other, even if we're wearing masks. So uh, no, we're not going to do another hands-on training session. If uh, so, if you've already requested training on either the Mira or the Rise, um, you know this is an experiment. We're going to count this as the training session. Uh, reach out to Deanna. So send an email to Deanna once this is done, letting her know that you attended the uh, online training session, and she will activate your access to uh, Rise and Mira, whichever one you you ask her to. Um, so at that point you will be free to come and book time on the scope and use the microscope. Um, so staff will be here every day. Um, so someone will be here. We're working, we have some different work from home schedules, um, but someone will be here in the lab, often me. Um, so if you have a, an issue, feel free to come knock on the door and ask us to come help you. Um, but realize that what that might look like is uh, we're not going to sit right next to you at the microscope. We may sit at the operator's chair and ask you to sit, you know, farther six feet away in the room so that you can see what we're doing. Um, but we're not going to be side to side. So, uh, no, there's not going to be another hands-on training session. This will count as a training session. Um, and, you know, if you email Deanna, she will grant your access. And hopefully um, we can help you then collect data uh, once you're ready. So what we're looking at, what I'm looking at now, uh, again, let me just bring up this uh, the Windows magnifier. Um, so here it, I'm watching the chamber pressure go from red. Eventually it will hit green. Um, you will want to... Um, you will want to wait. Just make sure that this goes to green. It shouldn't take more than like a minute or two, um, mainly because, you know, sometimes accidents happen. There could be a fiber on the O-ring and it may not pump down. Um, so it's better to catch that it didn't pump down so we can ensure it goes to vacuum. Because um, if you just click pump and go, maybe, maybe the pump down will fail. So just wait until it hits um, a good vacuum level. So we'll just watch it. It's just about there. And probably somewhere in the mid minus four range. There we go. So it's green. It is now okay for me to sign off. So at this point, what you would do is um, sign off your session in FOM. That way you're no longer charged for using the microscope. Um, Please leave the microscope room clean if you brought in chem wipes and stubs and things or um, there are little pieces of the carbon um, double-sided tape backer or the copper double-sided tape backer. Please remove that. Um, and then um, at that point, you're done. And uh, if you have any questions, send me an email uh, or you can reach out using our MC Squared staff email uh, and anyone on staff should be able to answer your questions and hopefully we will help you acquire some good data. Um, so thanks for signing on this kind of an experiment. Uh, as we move forward, we'll, we'll be doing some more training sessions. Um, so if you do want to see more e EDS, you could always request that and we can do an online training session for line scans and quantification. If you want to see EBSD, we can do that as well. Um, so at this point, I'm going to sign off. Uh, thanks and do email Deanna so